Good morning, this is Pauline. And I'm Howard. And we start today with the Society News for Friday, the 7th of July. Tuesday, the strollers will be meeting this Tuesday, the 11th of July. The stroll will be at Lake Green with lunch afterwards at the Hideaway, that's at 12.15. The group will meet for coffee at Peddler's Cafe at Langbridge at 10.30am. The next session of Introducing Millbrook House will take place on Tuesday the 11th of July. This is a chance for anybody to come along and discover what is available in terms of equipment or services to visually impaired people. Introducing Millbrook House is open to everyone who would like to find out more about what is on offer. The session runs from 10.30am till 12 noon. The Dolphins Group will be meeting to swim on Tuesday the 11th of July at the Waterside Pool Ride. The pool is closed to the public during the session. If you'd like to go swimming, please call the Society first to advise us of your level of swimming ability. Please note lifeguards are in attendance during the session. On Wednesday, the weekly coffee morning will be held as usual to support the Society this Wednesday 12th of July. The coffee mornings are not just for blind and partially sighted people. Anyone can come along and have a cup of coffee or tea as well as a piece of cake. Thursday, the Knitters and Natterers are meeting on the 13th of July at Millbrook House. The group starts at 10.30am and runs until 2pm. You can knit or just natter, then later in the afternoon volunteers come in and read to the group from different topics. Any other news? The Owls will be meeting 19th of July at 2pm in Millbrook House. The entertainment for the week's meeting will be White Harmony. The group lasts approximately 45 minutes, which is then followed by tea or coffee and cake. Please note transport may be available to some of the groups, but please call the Society first on 522205. As some of you are aware, the Society is conducting a client consultation survey. To give you an advance warning of the questions including the survey, it follows this recording. For as long as the survey continues. If you would like to complete a survey independently, please contact the Society on 522205 and ask for a copy. Alternatively, you can find the survey on our website at www. Sorry, I'll read that again. www.iwsb.org.uk. The Society has received some new padded wallets which will be trialled on both the Talking News and Library Service. If you receive one of these new wallets, you will notice instead of a Velcro top, they have a zip. However, you will still need to turn the address card round on the front as normal. Scaffolding news now. Here is a list of known footway obstructions for works including scaffolding or hoarding. We are unable to include end dates as many are extended on a week-by-week -week basis. Also included are tables and chairs permits that have been issued in the past week. The Bay Area... Lloyds Bank, Regent Street, Shanklin, 8 New Road, Braiding, 26 High Street, Sandown, due up on the 17th of July. The Cows Area, Development Site, Castle Street, East Cows, Carvel Court, Terminus Road, Cows, Royal British Legion, 85 High Street, Cows, due up 10th of July. Hoardings, 272 to 283 Arctic Road, Cows, 93 High Street, Cows, Jam and Sons, Thetis Road, Cows, due up on the 18th of July. New Scissor Lift, Waitrose, Well Street, East Cows, due up 14th of August, footway to be closed, bus stop to be out of action and may be relocated. The Newport area, Nippert Court, West Street, Newport. The Spectacle Maker, 81A High Street, Newport. Stead and Simpson, 121 High Street, Newport. 127 Honey Hill, Newport. Home Bargains, Taylor Road, Gunville Road, Carriesbrook, 136-137 Pyle Street, Newport, due up on the 17th of July. W. Hurst and Son, Crocker Street, Newport, due up 18th of July. Red Cross Shop, 9-10 to Town Lane, Newport, due up 24th of July. A current cherry picker at Home Bargains, Taylor Road, Carriesbrook, to be within hoarding. Ride Area, 25 George Street Ride. Ride Street Gallery, 129A High Street Ride, St Mary's Church Ride along St Mary's Passage, 49 Union Street Ride, Oasis Dental Care, 9 Melville Street Ride, Royal British Legion Club, 1 St James's Street Ride, Ride Town Club, Star Street Ride, The Cabin, Nelson Place Ride, Saltmead Cottage, Blewett Avenue Seaview, 
12 Nelson Street Ride, due up on the 10th of July. West White Area, The King's Head, Key Street, Yarmouth, Fries, Jewellers, Kimberley Road, High Street, Freshwater, Coleman's Carpets, Avenue Road, Freshwater, 51 to 53 School Green Road, Freshwater. The South White Area, 20 High Street, Ventnor, 47 Moorview, Godsill, 15 High Street, Ventnor, due up on the 18th of July. This week's In Touch. In Touch, in this week's episode, Cyrus Habib lost his sight when he was eight, and in January this year, age 35, took up an elected position as Lieutenant Governor of Washington State in America. He talks to Peter White about walking the fine line between sympathy and empathy when campaigning, and how technology is helping him to do his job. Listener Nick Adamson has been working for the same company in the same role for the last 12 years. He has no immediate plans to change jobs, but says contemplating a career move when you're blind throws up many challenges. He talks to Dave Williams, who has recently changed jobs, about his concerns. And now we're reading from the County Press for today, Friday the 7th of July. We start with the headlines. There's only one headline today, and it's a family broken by a punch. A son, husband, brother, father and uncle was taken from a family by a single vicious punch. That was the message from a family member of Nick Medlin, the prison officer killed in an attack outside a Ventnor pub in the early hours of Christmas Day. Michael John Hudson, who dramatically changed his plea to guilty on the opening day of his trial for manslaughter, was jailed for six and a half years for the single punch which killed Mr Medlin. Speaking outside Winchester Crown Court on behalf of the family, Ray Nottage, Mr Medlin's father-in-law, said, A single vicious punch has taken a son, husband, brother, a father and an uncle from a very close family. Nick was a decent gentleman. This was one cynical act of violence on Christmas morning, a time of peace. No satisfaction can be taken from the sentence to this person, only acknowledgement of this dreadful incident and its effect on our family. One punch and a life is taken and a family broken. Nick touched many people's lives. He will be seriously missed by all those who loved him, now stolen by an unnecessary act of violence. Our family has suffered six months of hell waiting for this court case. The defendant could have mitigated that situation by owning up to his actions earlier. He chose not to. That in itself is an act of cruelty, simply unforgivable. Clearly this gentleman, who has just been sentenced, is an extraordinarily callous individual. After Mr Medlin's death, I'm almost... 200 prison officers formed a guard of honour at his funeral and inmates wrote letters to the governor expressing their sorrow at his loss and describing how he had helped them in their lives. Mr Medlin, a former punk band bassist, was also an FA qualified football referee. Trading Standards is issuing an important warning to island consumers and businesses of cold calling by rogue traders. The conmen have been offering to carry out home improvement work including gardening, cleaning roofs and driveways, tarmacking drives and jet washing patios and paths. This latest warning comes after cold callers offering to tarmac drives were on the island this week and used the tactic that they were working with island roads, which is not the case. The conmen often call on vulnerable and elderly, elderly residents, but the council is warning businesses to be vigilant as well due to some work being offered at business premises. Commonly, cold callers are unqualified conmen who charge extortionate amounts of money for little or no work. The prices are often very misleading and immediate payment is demanded. Trading Standards Manager Julie Woodhouse said, Island residents should always be very wary of rogue traders who would cold call, as in our experience, they're often unqualified conmen who will overcharge for unnecessary repairs services which will be of poor quality. Legislation protecting consumers requires cold callers to give consumers a cancellation notice, giving them 14 days to cancel the contract made for over £42. Failure to issue the cancellation notice in the correct format is a criminal offence. A multi-million pound development at Robin Hill is under threat due to the landfill activities at Westred Waste Management next door, Robin Hill bosses have said. The development of tree houses and lodges called nesting has been given planning permission by the Isle of Wight Council, but Vectis Ventures, the company behind Robin Hill, has said the development may not go ahead if concerns with Westridge are not resolved. 
Vectis Ventures Chief Executive Alexander de Bell said, We've worked hard over the past few years to get planning permission granted, following the correct processes and ensuring all was done properly, only to have the whole development now put at risk because of the unauthorised and questionable activities of Westridge on our neighbouring site. Nesting will create hundreds of new jobs, bring millions into the island economy through construction of the development, ongoing business through the local supply chain and visitor expenditure, and, importantly, help to create year-round careers in tourism, something the island desperately needs. All this can now be lost. Vectis Ventures said it's the three main concerns with Westridge, and these are large building visually harming an area of outstanding natural beauty, a landslip of waste onto Robin Hill land, and a planning application for change of use for a landfill site. Visit IW Chief Executive David Thornton said, Waste management and tourism attractions both need their own airspace, but imagine the leaning Tower of Pisa right next to the town tip. It just doesn't work. At the time of going to print, Westridge Waste Management was unavailable for comment. Organisers have celebrated the success of this year's Round the Island race. There were 1,300 entries and relatively few incidents. The Yarmouth lifeboat was first called to assist two injured yachtsmen aboard Quarka, which had hit a submerged object close to the needles. One crewman broke a shoulder and another suffered minor head injuries. They were transferred to the lifeboat and taken to hospital. Off Hurst Castle, the lifeboat took a crew member from the 48-foot Marathon to land, where he was airlifted to hospital with a suspected burst appendix. Bembridge Lifeboat assisted a yacht with rudder problems to a safe mooring six hours after the start of the race. Ride Inshore Rescue dealt with five groundings at the notorious Ride Sands, which caught out yachts hugging the coast. One boat was appropriately named Blewett. Nearly all entries in the Round the Island, in association with Cloudy Bay, finished the race, in contrast to the storm-lashed event of last year. The island should be a testbed for cutting tourism VAT to 5%. The proposal came from Julie Jones-Evans, who made VAT reduction a key pledge in her general election manifesto. Her renewed appeal followed news. Part of the Democratic Unionist Party's agreement with Theresa May was a report should be commissioned on the impact of a reduction in VAT in the province. Councillor Jones-Evans had written to DUP leader Arlene Foster, suggesting she put the idea to Mrs May. It could be a game-changer for all coastal communities around the UK, boosting jobs and creating the environment for investment into the tourism offer, said the Isle of Wight Council member. Northern Ireland is a good place to start. A serious look at this issue, as they have to compete directly with the Republic of Ireland, which has a rate of just 9%. The Friends of Osborne House have raised £25,000 towards the restoration of the Andromeda Fountain. The newly restored garden terrace, with panoramic views across the Solent, was unveiled last week. The cheque was presented by Vice Chairman of the Trustees, Roger Crewe, to the General Manager, Rob Flower. Secretary Marja Tolley said the Friends had been fundraising for over a year with a number of events, including historical talks and pims on the tower. She said, I love Osborne House because I love history. It's right on the doorstep. If you're a friend, you can visit all the time, and when there's no one there, it's really peaceful and tranquil. I can understand why Albert and Victoria loved it so much. Rare bat at home at Nature Reserve. Those caring for a sea view nature reserve are delighted by bat conservation on the site. A three day survey of the Hersey Nature Reserve at Sea View Dover recorded eight species, including one new one, the very rare Restand Bar Bastel. They roost in splits in trees or behind loose bark. Joe King, a founder member of the reserve's new management committee, said the bat detector sounded like a jazz drumming machine. There were so many about. I was there for all three nights and it was magical, with bats weaving in and out of the trees and feeding above the water. The survey was carried out by the Isle of Wight Bat Group. All species observed, apart from the western barbastel, were foraging over the ponds or along the banks of Barnsley Brook. Dubon Dorbenton's bat activity was particularly high on one day, with as many as ten feeding on water surface insects. The soon-to-be-completed £25 million new Ride Academy does not have a sprinkler system. The decision was criticised by Ride Town Councillor Julian Critchley, who stood for Labour at the general election. He previously worked for the DfE and was a former teacher at a London comprehensive school. The DfE said all safety measures, including sprinklers, were considered when schools were being designed 
A DFE spokesman said all schools must have a mandatory fire risk assessment and new schools must undergo an additional check while being designed. Where that additional check states sprinklers or any other fire safety measures should be fitted in new schools, they must be put in place. As part of the cross-government response to the Grenfell tragedy, schools, colleges and universities have been instructed to carry out building checks. AET said it had no comment to make on Councillor Critchley's political statement. The Isle of Wight College has confirmed all its buildings are safe following a survey of the cladding in the wake of the Grenfell town fire and no safety concerns have been raised about cladding used at St Mary's Hospital following the fire at Grenfell Tower. Members of the Isle of Wight NHS Trust Board heard on Wednesday the Isle of Wight Fire and Rescue Service had not raised any concerns about the material. Academy's Enterprise Trust, AET, has been described as unfit to govern Sandown Bay Academy following the latest Ofsted inspection. The report was described as scathing by former Isle of Wight Council Education Spokesman Councillor Chris Whitehouse. He said senior management at AET should hang their heads in shame and write personally to the parents of every pupil and to every staff member to apologise unreservedly for the complete failure to support and develop what should by now have been a good school. This scathing criticism of AET by Ofsted comes as no surprise to those involved with the school and reinforces the clear message AET should be sacked forthwith. And similarly, Sandown Bay Academy is to be placed in special measures following the latest Ofsted report. The embattled school has been subject to controversy in recent months as the Managing Trust, Academy's Enterprise Trust, that's AET, has come under fire from parents and local politicians. While the Ofsted report noted several positives, such as above-average university placement rates, a sense of community and strong progress for autistic pupils at the Cove facility, the overall effectiveness was rated inadequate. The report found management failed to provide necessary support in the wake of the last year's cyber attack reported in the county press, which resulted in the widespread loss of important documents, including pupils' progress reports, teaching plans and exam work. Lower ability pupils and those with special educational needs were found to be lacking in support and guidance, while the most able students were missing opportunities that stretched and challenged them. The 16 to 19 study programmes were also found to be lacking, as students were not appropriately gaining the range of personal, social and employability skills that they should. It was highlighted many parents were concerned about the proposed merger with Wright Academy and didn't feel the school was improving quickly enough. One parent said the school should be a place of achievement, not struggles. Twelve days, a thousand miles, torn cartilage and more than £11,000 raised for the Injured Jockeys Fund, Debbie Attrell has finally returned home after completing her mammoth cross-country cycle. Debbie, who now works on a farm in Mayshaw, Devon, broke her back following a fall from her horse while competing in the Isle of Wight Hunt scurry 17 years ago and was told she would never walk again. However, thanks to help from the Injured Jockeys Fund, she's found her feet and wants to give back to the charity she says helped her so much. Beginning at Land's End, the former jockey set out on her 12-day cycle to John O'Groats and climbed more than 49,000 feet, around twice the height of Mount Everest, finishing on Sunday. Debbie said she was only defeated by one hill on the cycle. It was on the first day and was a 20% incline. However, I got fitter as the cycle went on and... On one of the last days, I was able to complete an eight-mile climb in the Scottish Hills. She called her decision to undertake the challenge brave or incredibly stupid. It just hasn't sunk in yet that it's over. Day four of the challenge proved the hardest. The combination of a dodgy back wheel and multiple hills left Debbie feeling overwhelmed, but she never considered giving up. I was always going to do it. I've had so much support, and that got me through. It's the toughest challenge, and everyone doing it was doing it for something that meant a lot to them. We each had a special region region reason to complete it ride arena users will have the chance to meet the ice rink landlord aew to discuss the future of the rink aew a london-based investment company shut the arena last october meaning rink users including ice ice hockey teams and synchronized skaters now have to travel to the mainland to practice and compete the closure also caused the loss of 30 jobs Island MP Bob Seeley met AEW in London last week to discuss the situation and find out more plans, more, find out more about plans for the site, which is leased from the Isle of Wight Council by AEW. The meeting between the company and residents is expected to take place in August. 
Mr Seeley will also be liaising with the council to ensure all options are explored. He said the future of the arena is important both to the island and the town of Ryde. An avid fossil hunter has discovered a tooth from a rare prehistoric rhinoceros that lived 38 to 35 million years ago. Theo Vickers, 18, of Ventnor, gave it to Dinosaur Isle Museum Sandown to care for and put on display. The Theo, who has just finished his A-levels and is off to study marine biology and oceanography at university in September, found the tooth of the rhino-like Ronzotherium washed up in sand on a beach in the Boldner Formation clays as between Yarmouth and Hampstead. Theo, who goes fossil hunting regularly, said he was looking for fossil teeth, bones or turtle shells when he discovered the molar from the Ronzotherium. I knew straight away it was a species of rhinoceros and after researching it further online, I contacted Dinosaur Isle Museum to bring it to their attention. As finds of primitive rhinos like Ronzotherium are really rare from the Boldner Formation, Theo said. I was incredibly lucky to find it, as only a few mammal species are found there regularly, let alone a species as rare as this. The clays where the fossil was found were laid down in a subtropical swampy floodplain similar to the Florida Everglades. Turtle, fish and crocodile fossils are very common along the island's northern west coast and Theo said he occasionally finds the bones and teeth of prehistoric animals that lived in the swamps. A businessman who has launched a rival bid to take over the Isle of Wight County Press has said he's been very encouraged by the volume and nature of support for his idea. Norman Arnold, who runs Isle of Wight recruitment firm Anchor, has called on the newspaper's board to delay signing a deal with NewsQuest. He described the county press as a local institution and said he feared a takeover by NewsQuest could lead, to it, lead it to lose that affinity with the island. It follows last month's announcement shareholders were considering a takeover bid from the second largest regional and local newspaper publisher in the country. A Facebook page in support of Mr Arnold's idea, Keep Local News Local Isle of Wight, had attracted hundreds of followers in its first 24 hours. Mr Arnold is calling, calling for a two-month halt to the proposed sale so a local bid can be properly drawn up to buy the newspaper. We have very little doubt that given the two months we request, we would come forward with a bid that would be acceptable to shareholders and ensure the county press remains a high-quality, independently-owned newspaper and online facility for many years to come. The county press has an island history going back more than 130 years. I really hope the current shareholders can give us two months in which to secure its unique place as an island institution. County Press Chief Executive Robin Freeman said, We received no specific proposals from Mr Arnold and are unable to comment further. NewsQuest didn't wish to comment. The County Press Chapel of the National Union of Journalists has also opposed the takeover, saying it feared for a loss of jobs and independence. The chapel has a near 100% membership within the paper's editorial team. In a letter to staff this week, County Press Management pointed out NewsQuest was in the process of opening new titles in the Dorset area, employing more journalists. And this is from uh, Mel Butler of the County Press. The Isle of Wight bus shelter is looking for a permanent site to house its vehicle since its temporary closure in May. The charity opened in November 2016 to tackle homelessness and has successfully helped to rehouse 22 people full-time and continues to provide support for them once they move into accommodation. Founder Kev Newton is stepping back from the island operation to take on the role of project manager, supporting new bus projects, which are cropping up all over the country. The new bus shelter manager is Carl Print, 43, from Porchfield, who was previously responsible for coordinating the night portering operation at St Mary's Hospital. He said we were previously set up at Sea Close Newport and had to leave the site because of the Isle of Wight Festival, but that was always a temporary home. We've been in contact with the Isle of Wight Council over some land near Parkhurst and Councillor Matt Price has been very supportive. If anyone has or knows anyone with land that would be willing to work with us in order to provide a secure long-term home for the bus, then please contact us on 07464 738 806. Aggressive geese, which have even managed to chase swans off Ride Canoe Lake, should be given their marching orders. Labour's parliamentary candidate, who was elected to Ride Town Council, called for action after complaints from the public about the birds and the mess they leave on paths. Councillor Julian Critchley told Monday's meeting, These Canada geese have proved a real nuisance, chasing other birds, including the swans and even young children. 
Councillor Critchley, who is a trustee of the waterside pool next to the Canoe Lake, said the Isle of Wight Council seemed to have given up on the problem. Councillor Charles Chapman said the geese could be removed humanely, but not while they had young. However, they will return next year because they like that stretch of water, he said. And a warning to dog owners. Police have repeated warnings to dog owners after a third sheep died in a week. Police are investigating after a lamb had to be put down and another was injured at Crooks Castle Farm, Roxall. Officers who have appealed for information say the lambs were savaged by what was thought to be a dog between June the 25th and 29th, close to the Shanklin to Roxall cycle track. They repeated advice to keep dogs on leads near livestock and warned farmers have the option to shoot pets if they attack livestock. A part-time shepherd has been fined £485 and given a 12-month conditional discharge after being found guilty of breaching animal welfare rules. Neil Robinson of Greenham Drive Seaview was also ordered to pay £1,000 costs. Island magistrates heard on Monday a sheep had to be destroyed after it was found by Isle of Wight Council's trading standards to be suffering from an enlarged udder. Robinson had also previously admitted failing to report the movement of sheep and failing to produce records of medicines given to his animals. He changed his plea to guilty to not registering the holding where he kept some animals and to failing to report the movements of his animals. The court heard Robinson kept sheep on land next to the RSPB Nature Reserve at Braiding Marshes, but the grass was too long. The land was also unsecured, allowing the animals to wander onto RSPB land and possibly onto the road. Council officers were concerned that the sheep could not access appropriate grazing. A sheep was also seen by the officer with an enlarged udder on nearby land in September 2016. Speaking in his own defence, Robinson said he'd looked after sheep all his life. And firefighters have been helping to tackle toxic algae at Shankling Big Mead Pond. Dead fish were discovered in the pond on Saturday afternoon and tests showed significant levels of what was believed to be cyanobacteria, also known as blue-green algae. That led to fears for wildlife, with the algae capable of killing a dog within 15 minutes of being ingested. At around 2pm on Monday, fire crews used hoses to attempt to oxygenate the pond and save some of the wildlife. Local councillor Chris Quirt said they've turned over the water quite hopefully dispersed some of the scum. However, the same rules still apply and people should keep children and pets away from the water. Red Funnel has been sold to a consortium of British and Canadian pension schemes. The consortium is led by the West Midland Pensions Fund and the Workplace Safety and Insurance Board of the province of Ontario. InfraCapital, the investment arm of M&G Investments, has owned Red Funnel since 2007 and has invested significantly in the business over the past decade in order to enhance both service and capacity, according to the company. In a statement, it said the fleet had been considerably upgraded and both onboard experience and customer service have markedly improved, with 93% of customers rating Red Funnel services as excellent or good. Ed Clark, co-founder and director of InfraCapital, said the hard work of the management team and the investments we've made have yielded, yielded significant benefits to customers, the community and its economy. We're confident Red Funnel will continue to grow under its new ownership and wish the business and its employees every success. Michael Campbell, director of the consortium, said Red Funnel plays a critical role within the community, is led by a strong management team and a committed workforce who are dedicated to delivering safe, reliable, essential Isle of Wight ferry services. We're pleased to continue the tradition of investment in this proud 150-year-old company. Red Funnel Chief Executive Kevin George said, We're grateful for the support given by Infra Capital and our customers over the past 10 years. Red Funnel has benefited hugely from a wide-ranging improvement programme of investment and improvement, and I'm delighted these are being recognised with fantastic customer feedback and repeat visitors. We're all excited to be working with the consortium as we continue to grow the business and provide safe and reliable ferry services, value for money and great customer service. A family who went to lay flowers in memory of loved ones at Egypt Point in Cowes was forced to cut the visit short after they were greeted by the sight and stench of untreated sewage on the pavements and toilet roll draped from seafront railings. Retired electrician Robin Box went to the landmark to pay respects to his late parents and father-in-law with his wife Patricia and sons Oliver and Mark on Monday last week. Mr Box, 60 of Cook Avenue, Newport, said, We went there to lay flowers as we do every year and what we saw and smelt was absolutely disgusting. 
There was sewage all around the beacon. The whole area was covered. I saw toilet roll hanging from the railings and there was human waste all over the pavement. We had to move along towards the beach where there was a clean area, laid the flowers and got out of there as quickly as possible. There was a high tide, a passing ship dunking its, dumping its waste in the Solent may have been responsible for it. Southern waters say its combined sewer overflow CSO pipe at Egypt Point was not the culprit, despite it once being one of the islands most notorious for discharges. The threat of terrorism stood in the way of more people enjoying the band of the Royal Marines at Ride's Armed Forces Day. Ride Mayor, Mayor Councillor Henry Adams told Monday's meeting of Ride Town Council the band was fantastic at the recent Esplanade event. But what a shame it was that it wasn't well attended, he said. I'm told that it wasn't well advertised for fear someone would come along and take a pop at them. Floating Bridge number 6 has been branded unfit for, pur for purpose by local campaign group Floaty McFloat Farce. Angry Islanders packed out East Cowes Town Hall last week to, to demand answers regarding the beleaguered Floating Bridge, which broke down once again last Friday due to an electrical fault. The 3.2 million vessel has been beset by problems since its launch in May, including technical issues and repeatedly running aground. Following a protest on Monday, Floaty McFloat Fast released an exhaustive list of complaints and concerns, saying the vessel was unfit for purpose. East Cow's community organiser and co-owner of Value For You, Angie Booz, said, These are not teething problems, but fundamental design flaws. The bridge is either crossing infrequently or isn't working at all. There are safety issues both on the bridge and on the pavement. It has inadequate space for pedestrians and it's not very accessible for people with disabilities and parents with double prams, among many other problems. Among the concerns were the dimensions of the new bridge, which is 28 tonnes heavier, 3 metres longer and a metre wider and taller than the previous vessel. According to information provided by the protest group, a study conducted by Southampton University found such changes would make the bridge unworkable. Isle of Wight Councillor Julie Jones Evans said, We're calling on the council officers to immediately publish what corrective actions are needed to fix this new bridge, with full economic costing and whether the bridge will be opening during those times, and pro prove the corrections will meet the Solent Local Enterprise Partnership's outcomes, such as increased crossings per day, or is at least as good and reliable as the old bridge. An Isle of Wight Council spokesperson said, We are aware of the issues raised by both the East Cows businesses and residential communities, and as discussed at the recent scrutiny meeting, these opinions will be considered through the review that was announced at scrutiny. The takeover by Ride Town Council of Isle of Wight Council Public Conveniences should go ahead, Town Council has decided. Discussion on the legal transfers of three of the loos and a lease for a fourth took place on Monday behind closed doors. The reason for it being held in camera was explained by Clark Saskia Blackmore. She said the issue is currently in discussion between two sets of lawyers and it's my view and that of our solicitor that the report should be discussed in confidential session. Families caring for children with life-threatening or terminal illnesses on the Isle of Wight will have help from a dedicated support worker thanks to Layla's Trust. The charity has made a £12,000 donation to the Rainbow Trust, a national organisation that specialises in helping families. It has appointed support worker Madeline Riley, who will provide emotional and practical support to families in their homes on the island, in the community and should they need to travel to Southampton General Hospital. Layla's Trust was founded in 2011 by island couple Emma and Coleman Cotter, whose daughter Layla died when she was just 10 weeks old. Emma said, Supporting the island community has unique challenges, particularly if your child becomes seriously ill. Layla's Trust is proud to have committed more than £12,000 to help fund Madeline's valuable work as a Rainbow Trust family support worker on the island. We first approached the Rainbow Trust Rainbow Trust back in 2012 to see whether it would be able to bring its services to the island and now, after years of planning and negotiation, we're so pleased to have it here and we're able to work together as a team for the betterment of our island community. Madeline said, my role is flexible so I'm able to fit in, fit in around them and provide ongoing regular support and unique to them as every family is different. I'm loving my new role, building relationships with the families and hopefully making a positive impact on their lives. 
Despite beating the Round the Island race record on Saturday by one minute, MOD 70 Concise 10 were unable to beat the time set by Red Jet 6. The Cross Solent Ferry laid down the gauntlet by storming around the island in only 1 hour 17 minutes and 17 seconds, the fastest recorded time to circumvent the Isle of Wight. Red Funnel enlisted the services of the World Sailing Speed Record Council to make it official. Starting and finishing on the Royal Yacht Squadron line off Cowes on Thursday, the average recorded speed, speed for the 50 mile course was 40 knots. Red Funnel Chief Executive Kevin George said the quad powered, powered vessel is the fastest red jet in our fleet and as she was built on the Isle of Wight by White Shipyard, it is only fitting that she should set a benchmark time for the multi yachts to try to beat. Lots of young girls dream of becoming a ballerina when they grow up. However, 11-year-old Jasmine Willits of the Ridge Medham Village Council is one step closer to that dream after being accepted as a junior associate for the Royal Ballet School. Beating more than 1,800 children for just a handful of places, Jasmine will now attend weekly classes in Eastleigh, Hampshire, and receive instruction from RBS teachers and professionals. Her aunt, Vanessa Willits, said, We're just so happy and so proud of her. This is a step in the right direction for her to pursue ballet as a career. The RBS is a world-renowned centre for classical ballet training and the Associates programme is designed to nurture young and talented students who show an aptitude and a desire to follow a career in classical ballet. Former Wright school pupil Sarah Close was on the same bill as Justin Bieber when she played BST at Hyde Park. The singer-songwriter, who rose to fame through YouTube and has clocked up millions of streams on Spotify with her single Call Me Out, performed tracks from her EP Caught Up on the Summer Stage on Sunday. She said, My set at BST Hyde Park was amazing. I was shocked at how many people came out to see me play. I had so much fun dancing and singing. I'm really looking forward to my September tour and to be doing it every night. The Isle of Wight College has been rated good overall following its latest Ofsted inspection. The rating is a step down from seven years ago when the college was judged to be outstanding. Inspectors who visited the college in May judged all aspects of the college to be good, with its adult learning programmes and provision for learners with high needs found to be outstanding. In its key findings, the report said, Adult learning programmes and the provision for students in receipt of high needs funding are outstanding. Students achieve their qualifications and develop a very good range of skills that prepare them well for employment. Staff have, recre have created an environment where students feel valued. Behaviour is good, students enjoy their studies and they are respectful. The report, which praised the leadership of ambitious college managers and governors, also said apprentices made good progress, with the vast majority achieving their qualifications. It added students develop good industry standard skills, attitudes and knowledge. As a result, the vast majority progressed to employment or further study. But inspectors also found too few students achieve functional skills qualifications in English and mathematics and not enough achieved a grade A to C in GCSE English. They started to improve its rating. The college needed to improve the quality of targets set by staff to students. The college also has Beacon College status for excellence and innovation in education. Newly elected Isle of Wight Tory MP Bob Seeley has delivered his maiden speech in Parliament. Speaking in a debate on Tuesday night, Mr Seeley paid tribute to the island's role as a home to great artists, scientists and innovators, from the poetry of Keats and Swinburne to the engineering genius of Thrust Project, as well as the likes of Ventnor Fringe at the Isle of Wight Festival. He also paid tribute to the former island MP Andrew Turner, who stepped down earlier this year after an outcry, outcry over comments about homosexuality. Andrew Turner was a kind man, a good listener, attentive to his constituents and held in very high regard by many of them, said Mr Seeley. Mr Seeley pledged to fight for a better deal for the island. It's not just a question of money, although every little helps, and I'll fight for extra spending on health and education. It's about islanders working with the government to generate ideas for the public good and about the government working with us and being keen to listen. I know there are good examples of that happening and I wish to encourage more of it, said Mr Seeley. He also committed himself to improving education standards and fighting for the future of Sandown Bay Academy. Untaxed cars caught in purge. 
A recent two-day police and DVLA purge in Ryde resulted in more than 100 vehicles being found to have no tax or lacking either MOTs or insurance, a meeting of Ryde Town Council heard on Monday. A shanking woman with long history of alcohol misuse and mental health problems died after an asthma attack and a combination of prescription drugs and alcohol, an inquest heard. Zoe Moody, 33, of Coronation Gardens, collapsed and died at her long-term partner's home in Dover Street Ride on October 26 last year. A post-mortem revealed she had taken a number of prescription drugs as well as drank alcohol before she collapsed at the flat, complaining that she could not breathe. The inquest heard that she'd struggled with mental health problems and also with heavy drinking. Island coroner Caroline Sumere concluded Mrs Moody's death was drugs and alcohol related. Don't miss your chance of slip sliding down Union Street. Organisers have warned people not to let the chance of taking part in a popular summer charity event slip through their fingers. The first four time slots for Ride Slide have now sold out with only a few tickets left for the whole event. There'll be a limited number of tickets sold on the day on a first come first serve basis from 2pm. This year on Sunday, July the 16th, the slide starts further down Union Street, guaranteeing a steeper, faster ride. As well as the giant slide, there will be a total wipeout style inflatable area at Western Gardens, which slide goers and spectators can enjoy for a small donation. Further entertainment comes courtesy of Ventnor Exchange, which will be running a pop-up record store at the Black Sheep Bar, with DJs playing from 11am to 7pm. The Needles landmark attraction has recently joined Ride Slide as one of the main event sponsors, alongside Isle of Wight Radio, which will be running a competition to win the two tickets on their breakfast show between 6am and 10am in the week, leading up to the event. And that concludes today's the first part of today's talking newspaper. So it's goodbye from me, Howard. And it's goodbye from Pauline. Good morning, everyone. It's the County Press for the 7th of July. And we begin with um, a letter from Jason Butchers, Freshwater Bay. I recently had the pleasure of taking a quick look inside the old co-op building in Freshwater and was delighted to see two young island lads have turned it into a hive of industry. If ever there was a shining beacon of hope for the future of the island, this is it. They are forging ahead with a great business producing quality clothing and I hope they are being supported in every way possible by the council as this is exactly what the island needs. I'm not sure how many employees have at present, but the more orders they have, the more they will need, and I have a feeling that Rapanui is going to be big. As this is an island-grown business, I would really like to see their product being sold in every outlet possible around the island, and I would like to wish them both well in the continued success they are clearly going to enjoy. Hello, this is Sarah. This is a letter from Beverly James of Lake. Please could I make an appeal to drivers on the Isle of Wight to slow down on the roads. Travelling from Lake on Monday, I'd gone through Apps Heath and just hit the 50 mile per hour sign. Entering the bend in the road before the Woodland Cemetery, there was a duck and a number of ducklings crossing the road on the bend. If there'd been a car travelling towards Sandown at the same time, they wouldn't have seen them and they would have ploughed into them. I was just lucky that I spotted them and brought the car to a stop so that she could safely cross the road. I understand there are two ponds on either side of the road. On my way back to work at 6am in the same direction, there was a dead badger near Sandown Airport. It seems every morning I see fatalities and I'm just grateful on this occasion that the duck and her ducklings weren't harmed. I'm sure it'll be the same across the island. I just ask drivers to take care, consider our wildlife and, of course, their own safety. And from Amber Beers of these cows, did I miss the memo? You know the one. The one that changed the use of Whippingham Road into a part TT racing track part Grand Prix circuit. I'm sure I must have done because that's what it seems to have become. Between the motorbikes screaming up and down at all hours of the day and night 
and the boy racers with their dodgy tailpipes. I am pardoned, I am pardoned the pun, exhausted, and more than a little fed up. Since the Barton roundabout was put in place, this seems to have exacerbated what was already a problem road for, for speeding. Does anyone actually slow down at all, leaving East Cows? I don't think they do. Coupled with this, we have surely the island's most dangerous bus stop, where mothers with prams, gangs of festival goers and shoppers perch on a metre square piece of concrete while the traffic roars by. One day someone will get killed on this piece of road and it will be one of those mums or a child or just someone going about their business. Please, Isle of Wight Council, police, island roads or whatever, sort it out before it's miles too late. Now, a letter from Councillor Julie Jones Evans of Newport. Floating Bridge 6 is still suffering from engineering and electrical issues. Yet the more I learn about it, the more it seems obvious that we're dealing with fundamental design flaws. It appears to be a, a classic case of functionality taking second place to visual appeal. Marcus Vitrius Pol Polio, the Roman architect, engineer and author, wrote that a structure must be solid, useful and beautiful. The floating bridge has always been a service of function getting us across the river, a vital part of the life and economy of both parts of cows, which is why the Solent LEP backed this project. This bridge is currently failing this law of design, which makes all the more difficult to see it, how it can be rectified. Why sacrifice the second passenger area for a large glass window? Why have a top deck which takes longer to embark and disembark and won't be used in poor weather? This feature was rejected 40 years ago. How can a design not be accommodating for disabled passengers to current expectations? It may be more economic to get back Floating Bridge 5, refurbish it as, it as was an option and get our functional crossing back across the Medina. Not only are businesses facing hardship in East Cars right now, but with the main season and Cows Week, which is a time many island businesses rely on, uh, uh, coming soon, what, what do the coming few months hold for them? Continued isolation? Customers choosing to shop elsewhere? How can a business plan ahead with a bridge that can't run for four hours a day? Everyone welcomed the charges holiday, which ended on Monday, and it proved popular. Councillor Love and I have asked the Isle of Wight Council to suspend the charges until the bridge is fully functioning. Traffic congestion in Newport has increased. Those taking free bus passes to take the long way round cost the council money. And people who don't have a tide table memorised just won't take the risk of the bridge not running. As a retailer, I know it's much easier to retain your existing customers than get new ones. And special offers are a great way to build your customer base. And from Ian McKee, Totlan. I emailed our new MP, Bob Seeley. Just after it was announced that Conservatives were seeking a coalition with the Democratic Unionist Party, DUP, to ask him to justify a deal with a party with a known history of connections to paramilitaries. Mr C replied to me, cataloguing his disagreement with the DUP on social issues, the attempts by Labour to forge an alliance with them in 2010, and views on re-establishment of the power-sharing executive in Northern Ireland. Not once did he mention the subject of the DUP's connection with terrorism. Mr Seeley, a former spin doctor, has reverted to type and answered the question which he wanted to ask and not the question he actually asked. That was actually asked. He actively avoided the uncomfortable question 
one which undermines the Conservatives' claim to be the party of law and order. A letter from Dick Downs of Atherfield. <clears throat> and the headline is, Are we kept off this beach for our own good? I'd like to thank the Isle of Wight Council for keeping the access to Chale Bay via Whale Chine closed for the last 10 to 15 years. Many lives have probably been saved by keeping the foolish general public from sunbathing under cliffs, which are liable to collapse on them, and swimming in the dangerous currents off this piece of coast, not to mention sharks. The promise of prosecution on the notice board attached to the fence round the top of the steps has probably helped to keep people away as well. Indeed, I have heard that some locals have been in discussion with the Isle of Wight Council recently and voiced their intention to go down the chine, were told the police would be informed if they did. I'm lucky enough to have alternative access to this three-mile stretch of beautiful beach and it's been wonderful to have no competition for the fossils and fishing down there and be entirely on my own to enjoy it, while the crowds further along at Compton are shoulder to shoulder on their overcrowded beach. The island depends on tourism, is famous for its beaches and is along with the Jurassic Coast in, Nor Nor in Dorset, one of the top locations in Europe for fossils. So many locals and visitors have asked why is one of the best beaches on the island clo closed? You have to ask, why do we have a council that spends more money protecting the public and the fossils by fencing off the access than it would have cost to repair the steps to the beach in the first place? Many residents are puzzled by this state of affairs. So this subject has been placed on the agenda of the next Chale Parish Council, which will be held in the Chale WI on Monday at 7pm. Members of the public are welcome to come along and add their views to the discussion. Now we have a letter from Tim Bowman from London. I am once again left both perplexed and angry at a fresh planning application by Westridge Waste which has established, it seems by stealth, a waste processing facility in the area of outstanding natural beauty, that is the Comley area. Once again, the new application is retrospective. In other words, the site owners have gone ahead and intensified their inappropriate activity without being granted planning permission. An earlier retrospective application is currently subject to a planning appeal committee, the Isle of Wight Council, which rightly threw out the application, to spending untold sums of our money defending its legitimate democratic actions. The rest of us seem to have grasped the notion that before we embark on major development, we apply for planning permission. Why does West Ridge Waste have such a problem with this process? I applaud the Isle of Wight Council for so far standing firm. This area is a highly sensitive location as not only is it a, uh, an area of natural beauty. It is also adjacent to Robin Hill, an attraction much loved by generations of youngsters, me and my family among them. I would urge, urge those who care about protecting the island's natural amenities and indeed local democracy to oppose the current application and ask to their local elected representatives to do likewise. Now, over to looking back and a hundred years ago, this is July the 7th, 1917, alcohol was significant, significantly harder to purchase in 1917. Wine and spirit merchants, W.B. Mew Langton & Co., issued a notice to its customers reminding them beer and wine 
could only be purchased weekdays between noon and 2.30 p.m. and from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Spirit sales were limited and could not be sold from 2.30 p.m. on Friday until noon on Monday. An islander wrote a letter to the newspaper regarding the announcement that Prince George of Battenberg was to take the title Earl of Medina. He wrote, The question is asked whether this refers to our island Medina. I'm writing without authority on the subject, but I know of no other Medina to which it can refer. Although he wrote, subject to correction, he stated he believed Medina had never been adopted as a title before then. And 75 years ago, July the 4th, 1942, the front page featured Mrs Flynn celebrating her work starting 131 savings groups. Between August and November 1940, she called on every house in her ward and started 45 savings groups. And over the next two years, the number of groups continued to, to grow. Braving sharks, Japanese planes and sea mines, an islander revealed his daring escape from Singapore. Mr and Mrs McLeod Carreri of Ryde revealed the escape of their son, Lieutenant Colonel <coughs> McLeod Carey. McLeod Carey wrote that with four friends, he took a small racing dinghy from the yacht club and set out on an adventurous voyage which lasted over three weeks and covered 1,600 miles. On several occasions their dinghy was swamped and they had to take shelter on marshy islets on their way to a Dutch settlement. Beside the dangers from the Japanese plains and mines, the seas were indeed infested with sharks. <coughs> Fifty years ago, <coughs> Newport agricultural student George Bush gained the highest award for poultry husbandry in the final examination of Cumberland and Westmoreland College of Agriculture. George obtained a credit certificate and also received the Principal's Prize for the student placed first in the examination and the Gilchrist Prize for the best agricultural student on the poultry course. Also 50 years ago, a cow's built yacht retained the gold in the round the island race. The boat roundabout made history when she was crowned the overall winner of the gold Roman Challenge Cup for the second year in a row. The article stated this unique achievement was a tribute to the fine craftsmanship of those responsible for building the boat. And 25 years ago, July the 3rd, 1992, angry coach drivers were due to stage a blockade at Shanklin Esplanade in protest at their eviction from the spa site parking area. Eight drivers and their coaches were on the Esplanade at 9am to block off the entrance to the site, which the council had decided to turn over to cars only, June, July and August. The council director said the question of coach parking in peak, peak season is a growing problem which must be addressed when the 1992 parking order is reviewed. One coach driver said this is getting ridiculous. If it comes back to it we will block roads down there and park the coaches in the main street. We don't want to hassle but they don't want to listen and Councillor George Wilson called on islanders to fully utilise seaweed as a natural resource. He had converted varieties of the plant to topsoil for many years at his ride allotment, but wished to see the possibility of its wide-scale use investigated. He claimed his allotment had a poor clay soil when he took it over, but after five years of treatment with seaweed, it had a good 18 inches of topsoil. He suggested the Borough Council should follow the example of Leicester 
and bring in 10-year leases to encourage allotment holders to go, go organic. Members lacked the idea and it was put forward to the council. Sorry, members backed the idea and it was put forward to the council. Uh, last of all, 10 years ago. Island life is healthier according to a national survey released this week. It was discovered islanders were healthier and living longer with life expectancy increasing faster on the Isle of Wight than anywhere else in the country. However, obesity, children in poverty and low academic achievement were identified as key areas for improvement. The figures also showed there was slightly more violent crime on the island but less teenage, teenage pregnancy. Now, also 10 years ago, pigs' tails and snails washed down with cold onion gravy, Tabasco sauce and maple syrup. A group of students went to extreme lengths to raise money for charity, taking part in a Bush Tucker trial in aid of the Isle of Wight challenge and adventure. The final and most gut-churning challenge featured cooked pigtails washed down with a blended shot of cold beans, chilli peppers, mussels, fish, eggs, veggie vindaloo, lemon mm. and cold coffee. <laughs> Looking back ten years ago, a mainland couple had a lucky escape when they were hit by the branches of an oak tree which had broken away from the cliff. Pitts, Light and Sarah Shaw became trapped under the debris when the main trunk of the hundred-year-old tree landed, landed between them. Now, over to White Memories. Alan Stroud takes a journey back to the heyday of jiving and the birth of rock and roll. It only lasted two minutes, eight seconds, but that was enough. In 1954, Bill Haley's Rock Around the Clock let the rock and roll genie out of the bottle. Within a year, Elvis Presley had arrived, and across the island, teenagers gathered in coffee bars to pay homage to that other arrival from America, the jukebox, while they drank their frothy coffee. Heady days indeed. Local dance hall owners saw the writing on the wall and the traditional dance bands were quickly elbowed out to be replaced by rock and roll or skiffle groups and not just local ones. The list of well-known acts who appeared here from the mid-1950s to the late 1960s is an impressive one. In the 1950s, it included Tommy Steele, Lonnie Donegan and Marty Wilde, not forgetting Newport's own milkman turned pop star, Craig Douglas. Was it a was a slow start, though. The next year, Lonnie Donegan came to the Commodore at Ride, selling out two shows. He sang songs straight from the Georgia cotton fields, Shamelessly stolen, said some, including Lordy, Shall Not Be Moved, and Alabama, Alabama Bound. <laughs> on television, on television, Donegan gave a surreal edge to proceedings by performing the songs wearing a Savile Row tuxedo and bow tie. One of the next attractions at the Commodore was Sabrina, a 21-year-old Stockport girl who enjoyed enormous fame and was in the newspaper parlance of the day a sex bomb and sultry siren. <laughs> she was described as a singer and actress, both fairly slender claims since the truth was she was more widely known for her 42-inch bust. In, in June 1957, at the height of her fame, she came to the Commodore and entertained the crowd with those old perennials. I want a man, not a mouse. It's better in the dark. And persuade me. In a 1956 
in in the nine in 1956 goon harry seacombe in the guise of a radio presenter said mrs gladys quimby would like to hear sabrina sing so would i in 1958, the singing milkman became the island's first pop star when a 17-year-old Terry Perkins of Newport won a local talent contest and changed his name to Craig Douglas and went on to have nine top 40 hits. Terry is an unassuming young man with a friendly smile, reported the county press. One of eight children, Terry of Prospect Road, Newport, is a milk roundsman. Not for long. Rapidly leaving the crates behind him, Craig enjoyed a string of hits until in 1963 the Mersey sound arrived and like many of his contemporaries, overnight he ceased troubling the charts. That year he appeared on the TV show Thank Your Lucky Stars. The Rolling Stones appeared on the same programme and in his 1990 autobiography A Stone Alone, Bill Wyman recalled Craig Douglas had given our debut single a poor review and the stones never forget anything we knew he'd been a milkman so we went round the studios gathering up empty milk bottles and put them outside his dressing room door with notes saying two pints please <laughs> furious he reported us to the producers who sternly reprimanded us in 1964 wyman trod the island boards and the audience was keen very keen about a dozen teenage girls, armed with blankets and hot drinks, waited all night outside the Esplanade Pavilion ride on Saturday to get tickets for the Rolling Stones concert on March the 22nd. All the girls were in their early teens and produced written permission from their parents to, sh to the show organiser. They included Pat Searle, Brenda Hale, Linda Brown, Anne Michelle and Celia Lake. In April 1965, the Beatles' single Ticket to Ride was released. Councillors at Ride discussed whether there was any capital to be made from what was thought at the time to be nothing more than a happy coincidence of wordplay. The county press reported, Mr R. V. Bourne said there was a first-class opportunity for the publicity department to use a play on the title in their national advertising. One of his suggestions for an advertisement was why not take a ticket to Ride this summer? Had Mr Brown known it, the title really was a direct reference to Ride. McCartney and Lennon visited Ride several times in, in the early, 19, 18, early 1960s to stay with Paul's cousin, Bet. McCartney's 1998 book, Many Years From Now, co-written with Barry Miles, relates Mike and Bet became the pub publicans of the Bow Bars in Union Street ride and Paul and John hitchhiked down again to stay with them. It was a journey which would reappear, punningly, in the single's title. Just as well they didn't go to Scun Scunthorpe. <laughs> <laughs> now, my view. The Father of the Bride, an article, that's the headline, the article is by John Young. This is one of the panel of column, columnists who take it in turn to give their take on life as it's played out on the Isle of Wight. The Father of the Bride I've been invited to a wedding. I shall have to go because I'm going to be the father of the bride. There are apparently some financial implications to this role. And so in the last month or two I've been on a fairly steep learning curve to do with the cost and the mechanics of modern-day nuptials. It will be the first wedding in which I've played a leading role since my own, which was in the West White in the 1980s. It was in the middle of a winter. This was unavoidable since the whole enterprise was agreed upon on a camper van holiday in July, and as I explained to my new fiancé, it took me six months to organise a press ball, so it would take me six months to organise a wedding. Romantic or what? The cake was by far the biggest hassle. One of the local suppliers was a little shop on Totland Broadway. 
where we quickly discovered wedding cakes were offered on more or less a take-it-or-leave-it basis. With limited success, the future Mrs. Young negotiated a couple of tweaks and twirls. As we left, and in the time it took for the door to fully close on the sprung hinge, the manageress's verdict on us to her assistant came drifting out. What a lot of fuss about a cake. It cost us £37 too, which was a lot of money in those days. My mother tended to side with the cake shop. This was because for her wartime wedding, it was apparently as much as you could do as to get hold of the icing sugar. The alternative was shaped white cardboard. Auntie Cynthia had a family connection with Cooper's Bakery in Binstead. Mother got the icing sugar, tweaks and twirls, we should think ourselves lucky. From mother-in-law also with bakery connections as a teenage production line operative comes a further insight into how to deal with rationing. The powers that be who decided V Day should be celebrated with street parties gave ve- but street parties gave very little guidance as to where things like the egg custard were to come from. Simple, drop a floor cloth into the cooling vat, fess up to the supervisor and get the batch condemned, fish out the floor cloth, surreptitiously make off with the dodgy mixture and make make it up into tasty slices. Appear as a heroine of the, of the hour, keep shtum. You have to eat a peck of dirt before you die. Anyway, on our big day, six months on from the camper van, it snowed. Hardly proper snow, no more than an inch, but the island's first for several years and more than enough to bring out the Dunkirk spirit, not to mention the loan of the florist fur coat and the addition of an extra limo to the one ordered. Free, gratis and for nothing, so the bridesmaids didn't have to hang about in the slush. The absence of several guests from the mainland, where it was actually snowing in earnest, meant a crash course in how to be an usher for a pair of lads who thought they were only there for the beer. Likewise, <clears throat> likewise, 11th hour reception invitations to one or two friends of the family withheld originally on account of their fondness for a sherry or three, served as a reminder of how good our original judgment had been. Yes, there were speeches. I remember nothing whatsoever about them, and I shall have to brush up. Any suggestions about how far one is supposed to go down these days in the risque department would be more than welcome. I'm also entering the shark-infested waters of celebration barns, hog roasts and minimum spends, of cocktails and canapes, of hired bright blue wedding suits and of favours, which apparently involve the couple giving the guests presents rather than the other way around. My, how things have changed. For advice on matters such as those, I'm afraid I shall probably have to go go and see my bank manager. And from Amy Mackledon, I didn't want to talk about bins, but this week they called to me like poems about the sea to a bad poet. News the Isle of Wight Council is launching a recycling campaign comes after several major changes to bin collections and the newly implemented tip restrictions. It seems as though it's getting more and more difficult to throw things away. The new campaign focuses on items put into recycling bins or gull-proof sacks that shouldn't be there. The solution? Waste company Arnie simply won't empty the bins if incorrect items are in there. I guess we can look forward to more trash on the streets then. And now that Tip visits require special vouchers. There's a very real concern that fly tipping will increase. Without your special book of vouchers, you'll get turned away from the tip like a trainer wearing ID-less punter at a local nightclub. Even if your car is filled to the brim with rubbish, 
If you haven't got a voucher, you ain't coming in. No acceptors. So where are people expected to keep their rubbish exactly? But in exciting news, that's not about bins. Businessman Norman Arnold has launched his own bid to take over the county press, urging fellow islanders to keep the paper local. I personally love the idea, and his passion shows just how important the paper is to islanders. I know I'm not alone as a CP reader of many years in valuing the paper's dedication to celebrating the unique place that we live in. And the island is, is unique. Arriving home is always a relief. And life moves at a different pace here. Having lived in Newcastle for nearly a decade, I totally value the island's atmosphere and the chance it provides to switch off completely. From the quieter streets to the plethora of local business to the buzzing music scene, the island has so much to offer. While it's impossible to avoid anything that's happening in the world, at least here we can ignore Trump's less than presidential tweets and visit the original Phil's Diner instead, where the food is American, but the politics are not. And as for Theresa May's coalition of chaos, just forget it altogether with a trip to Black Gang Chine. As islanders, we're not immune to the world's seemingly constant and chaotic political and bin collection changes, but we can pretend that we are for now. So, this is also about recycling. <laughs> this is behind the news. Rotten recycling rascals beware. <laughs> bin men pouncing on a householder's recycling bin because the contents include five sheets of paper may, may have seen, seemed a tad harsh, but it was a symptom of a new crackdown. The tough stance is coupled with an education campaign launched this week on social media. It's symbolised it's symbolized by three new R's. Not the well-worn reduce, reuse, recycle mantra, but rotten recycling rascals, which on each of 15 days of Facebook and Twitter will focus on some very wrong things found in bins. It's a response to people popping all sorts of stuff in the green bins, not just a bit of paper in with the rest. Because of the way the system works, or currently does not work very well on the island, more and more lorry loads of recycling material are being rejected as contaminated and sent to rubbish tips, which, as we know, are filling up fast. It also means council taxpayers face a bill of tens of thousands of pounds in landfill tax. So, in tandem with the crackdown, which extended to one lady's waste being rejected, because she had not separated the plastic from cardboard on a light bulb box, the council and its rubbish partner Amy want to, or Amy, want to educate us. They sent a representative to Lake to talk to householders who were aggrieved at the draconian stance of the bin men and then launched the campaign to tell us why it's important. Currently, 20% of the island's recycling is rejected as contaminated. That actually adds up to 40 tonnes a week, metal, plastic and glass sent to landfill, which could for the most part have been recycled. That equates to six full recycling lorries. As things stand, separated recyclables are sent for reprocessing into new products, but if the wrong items are included, Entire loads can be rejected. Orange peels, for example, and with the mixed recycling, of course, that in the past. But it gets worse. Oil cans, paint tins, black bags of rubbish, vegetable peelings, cushions, duvets, cooking oil, uneaten pizzas and even dead chicks have been found. Amy's crews are trained to assess the level of contamination in a roadside bin in an attempt to reduce contamination. New bin hanger notices have been introduced to help educate residents 
about which items they are currently not recycling correctly. These explain why a bin has not been emptied and will not be until foreign matter is removed. Amy's Island manager, Paul Savile, said the bin hanger, which tells the homeowners their bin is contaminated, is being introduced as part of the contamination campaign and contains images of the most commonly placed wrong items in bins or gold-proof sacks, such as food, polystyrene, wood, contaminated food packaging and garden waste, with instructions where they should go. Any recycling bin or green gull-proof sack with items which cannot be collected as part of the recycling service will not be emptied by collection crews. Recycling correctly is really important as waste has a huge negative impact on the natural environment. Harmful chemicals and greenhouse gases are released from rubbish in landfill sites. As oxygen is unable to break down the waste, even if it is food, when it is buried. The home's recycling collection system can handle only items that can be reliably sold to buyers for use in new products. As a result, items that can't easily be processed on existing machinery or things which are contaminated with food or other substances should stay out of your home recycling bin, said Paul. Part of the problem is the fragmented recycling system on the island, which the new contractor is putting right by constructing a purpose-built waste facility at Newport Forest Park, where waste will be sorted, but that won't be ready until the end of next year. Meanwhile, paper is sent direct to a mainland mill and other recyclables to a materials recovery facility in Cambridgeshire. When a load arrives, there a sample is taken to detect contamination. Amy has seen a sharp rise in recent weeks. If a load is rejected, it either goes to the tip or if it's paper or card, burned to make electricity. Michael Merwill, Isle of Wight Council Cabinet Member for Waste Management, summed it up. When incorrect items are included in recycling, they can cause problems, including halting operations at recycling and processing plants. Even unwashed or oily food packaging can, can contaminate an entire load of recycling, diverting it to costly landfill. Hmm. Over to what's on the next, coming up now, in the next week. Um... First of all, oh, we're going to talk about tea dances. This is Braiding Town Hall next Tuesday from 2 to 4. The tea dance and live music with Chick and Bernie. Then in Newport on Tuesday at 9pm, there's a charity quiz in aid of the Isle of Wight Air Ambulance. This is at the Hong, the Hong, Hong Kong Express, Newport. Then this is Red Thai Theatre and the Apollo Theatre. They present Isle of Wight Pride Arts Week, Theatre, Music, Art and the Spoken Word. This is from Tuesday to Thursday at 1pm at the Apollo Theatre, Newport. Another tea dance in Dover Street Ride at Aspire. This is Wednesday, 2pm to 4pm. Um, Cheek and Bernie, another tea dance, is at Sandown on Wednesday from 2 till 4 at St John's Church Annex. And the last of these events, a charity quiz, quiz night at the Newport Ale House on Wednesday at 8.30. And then also the theatre, the, the Lynette Bailey Academy of Dancing presents... Five, six, seven, eight at Medina Theatre, Newport on Saturday, and the Red Tie Theatre and the Apollo Theatre present the Queer Bash. That's at the Apollo Theatre, Newport, Tuesday and Wednesday at eight p.m. Best of the West End is at Shanklin Theatre, 
Wednesday and Thursday at 8.15 and Red Tide Thai Theatre and the Apollo Theatre present The Beautiful Thing at the Apollo Theatre Newport Thursday at 8pm. And a further reminder of the do's and don'ts with, with regard to your recycling litter and the bin problems. First of all, paper and card should be separated into the insert box blue gull sack. Black plastic waste sacks are for general waste. Food should be in the food caddy. Garden waste should be co composted either at home through the green waste service or through household recycling centres. Oil should be emptied from plasto plastic glass bottles before the bottles are put in the mixed recycling. Ceramics and Pyrex should go in general waste or to a recycling centre. Sanitary waste goes in general waste. Textiles must be separately collected in a bag alongside the recycling. Polystyrene cannot currently be recycled and should go in black bins, gull sacks. Back to what's on. Fab classes keep you fit. Um, this is about some classes held. Shanklin Age Concern on Tuesday mornings at 11.45. Personal trainer Ellen Robinson believes you can be fit for life, including, including your later years. So, as part of her ongoing commitment to train people in, the, in their later years... Ellen runs weekly FAB 50 and Beyond fitness sessions at three separate venues in Shanklin, Beatrice Course, Westfield and Shanklin Age Concern. You can have a, a light lunch and a chat afterwards. That's all from Sarah and Barry. And we, Good. Wish, we all wish you a very happy weekend and um, in enjoy the sunshine. <laughs> Goodbye. This is the BBC. This is In Touch, the magazine programme for people like me who are blind or partially sighted. I'm Peter White. Thanks for downloading this week's edition. Good evening. Tonight, he's been dubbed one of America's men to watch. Cyrus Habib is already well launched on a political career and he'll be explaining how a combination of modern technology and chutzpah is helping his climb. And by way of contrast, we also hear how in the current UK employment climate for visually impaired people, staying in your comfort zone can hold back your career. The concept of starting at a new office and learning a new office and learning all the new systems, it's just a daunting prospect. More about should I stay or should I go later in the programme. But first, blindness and partial sight needn't be a bar to political success. David Blunkett is the obvious UK example, of course. And just a few weeks ago, Marsha de Cordova reflected on this programme on her surprise victory in the general election. What effect her visual impairment might have on the way she tackles the job of MP. Well, she could do worse than have a chat with Cyrus Habib. Totally blind and still only 35, he's just been appointed as Washington State's Lieutenant Governor, having already spent more than five years, first in the State House of Representatives, then in its Senate. He identified himself as a high flyer when he became editor of the prestigious Yale Law Journal. But American politics is a cutthroat business. Well, I've been talking to Cyrus Habib about his steady rise and about how he tackles the nitty gritty job of campaigning. In my first race in the State House of Representatives, I personally knocked on over 7,000 doors and uh, my campaign when you factor in staff and volunteers, did about three times that. So, you know, I, I think that that can be a little bit more challenging. But I would say, as silly as it sounds, the biggest challenge was just making sure that people actually knew that the reason I was wearing sunglasses was because <laughs> I'm blind and, you know, and not just because I was trying to look cool. Uh, <laughs> that, that, you know, it, it may sound 
like it wouldn't be an, an issue or a problem. But when people are just looking at a photo, they don't really understand. Why would you be wearing you know, a suit and tie and then wearing sunglasses? And so the very delicate balance we had to strike was informing people that I'm blind, both so that they wouldn't draw the wrong conclusion and also so as to connect my lived experience with the values that I hold, but then not going so far as to reducing me to a stereotype or a disability or even worse, seeking to, or, you know, looking like we're, we're pandering or, or trying to get sympathy. And you have to get them to believe that you can do the best for them, don't you? Yeah, I definitely think, you know, you, you want to convey strength and skill and competence and preparedness and, and all of those things that voters want to see. But at the same time, you want to demonstrate that you understand the struggle. That's not everyone's political message, but it's really important for me because it's such a critical part of how I came to my political philosophy and my approach towards the role of government. And so you're absolutely right that you want to describe, look, um, I understand whether you are facing economic hardship or a disability or a racial or ethnic barrier. I understand what it's like to be excluded or counted out or limited by society. And I understand what it's like to fight to be included again. And so that's a story that we definitely wanted to tell while also being very clear that there's no risk of me not being able to do the job. And so one of the ways in which we did that was, you know, by using this slogan in my TV commercial, which I was a little bit uncertain about at first, which was to say that I went from Braille to Yale. Um, (laughs) And, you know, to me, that phrase captures both dynamics, right? Because you're, you're then saying, well, when you say Braille, people understand that you've had to learn to do things differently, that you've had to be creative and work hard. But when you say Yale, because Yale has a brand in our country and and globally of excellence and competence, you kind of also set people's mind at ease that you're going to be able to do the job. And I was a little bit wary of doing that because I, you know, I didn't want to take on all the, the kind of baggage of elitism that might come with the name Yale. But I was told by advisors, and I think this was very good advice, that in your case, it's important to do that so people don't think, oh, well, okay, he's blind, you know, I feel sorry for him, good for him that he got over that, but but we really need someone who can be prepared to step in in the event of an emergency, and, you know, I don't know that sympathy is, is the metric we want to use. We need to make sure that someone's really, really qualified. So that phrase, I think, really gets at that balance. It's an interesting one because, I mean, it's all very well to take on these challenges, but how hard do you think it will actually be for you to do the job? I mean, you were talking about having to actually preside at the Senate, for example. I, I think you've got some pretty flash equipment there to help you do that, haven't you? What we had installed are touch screens on every senator's desk. There are 49 senators, and so when they want to speak rather than simply standing up and saying, Mr. President, to be recognized, they now stand up and say, Mr. President, and touch this screen on their desk. That sends their name up to a computer that I have in front of me with a Braille display on it, and then all the names of the senators who want to speak are displayed in Braille in real time right in front of me so that I can, by touch, know who it is who's requested to speak. I always knew while I was campaigning that we would find a way to do it, but this was really, really impressive. You know, even to me, someone who who has a deep faith in the ability of adaptive technology to level the playing field, this was really, really exciting for me. And it showed me that when we combine hard work and creativity, and particularly when we put our money where our mouth is and provide resources, we can achieve nearly anything Uh, as people with disabilities, that anyone else can. And our society can make nearly anything possible. You know, what, what I often do is when I describe that, I say, look, now imagine a world in which every kid in every classroom were given the type of personalized attention and care to accommodate their abilities and disabilities as I was given 
as the lieutenant governor. You would see people truly living up to their full potential. Yeah, uh, There is another debate that goes on in both our countries, which is about the extent to which special provision ought to be made. Uh, and that's certainly true in the area of visual impairment. I know and one of the things you did is you led the fight, I think, to try to make US money accessible to blind people because American notes are the same size, which is one of the most obvious ways to make them different. That's still the case, isn't it? It's not It's not a battle that's been completely won. Well, it, it has in, in the sense that we um, just last year it was announced that the next bill that comes out will be tactilely distinguishable and they, so they should be from now on. With the economic challenges that we were having, there weren't new bills authorized until just recently. But the, there was some fight, I believe, on the part of some blind people saying we don't need to be babied in this way, you know, that, that we can actually cope with it. Yeah, but I, I think that actually had more to do, honestly, with infighting among different blind advocacy organizations. This was not the first time that this had happened, that, you know, one organization takes on a particular battle and then the other one will say, no, no, that's not really an issue. And my intervention on that particular topic was to talk about and, and ultimately make a legal argument around the obstacles faced by blind workers. You know, it's not just a question of convenience for the blind customer who needs to be able to distinguish a $5 bill from a $10 bill, but think about the challenge to somebody who's trying to work at an entry-level job, which often requires the ability to denominate one bill from another, that then becomes virtually impossible because you have to ask others for help or, or uh, now there's, there's uh, you know, software for smartphones that can do it, but it's not practical from an employment perspective. And so I think that that organization that took the position you're describing was being short-sighted, uh, for lack <laughs> of a better term. Cyrus Habib and uh, you'll be able to hear a longer version of that interview later this year as part of Radio 4's No Triumph, No Tragedy series. When we stay with employment, uh, Mike Kelly's at the other end of his career. He generated a big response from you a couple of weeks ago when he owned up to his fears about retirement. He wanted to broaden his horizons when he left work but he wondered if he had the skills and the confidence to try out new things. In a way, I feel that I'm going to be starting all over again, having to learn new skills, new ways of doing things. I do have some things lined up to do. For instance, Wendy, my wife and I are National Trust members, and I'd like to maybe do some work there, perhaps maybe even become a room advisor if that's possible. I'd like to learn to cook if that's feasible, do the gardening, take up archery. There's lots there, you know, it's, it's a, an open page, really. It's just knowing what's possible and what's not. Well, many of you were keen to help. Duncan Bell, for example, he's got some good news on becoming a room guide with the National Trust. He says, I submitted my application to be a room guide at the end of March, had an interview in mid-May, and I'm now reading and learning the facts from the house guidebook prior to starting. He says, the only rooms I can't really work in are those that contain small but valuable items which people might be tempted to walk off with. And Glenys Hill, who's a member of her local University of the Third Age, spoke for many listeners who suggested Mike did the same thing. She says, there's a book group, Tai Chi, Cake and Bake, Bridge, Military History, Classical Music, Science and Technology, as well as monthly lunches at local pubs. Uh, we have members who are partially sighted, and I don't anticipate there being any issues for Mike. Well, Mike Kelly's story also chimed with listener Nick Adamson, but for a different reason. Nick? He's only 35, not thinking about retirement yet, but for him, changing jobs throws up a similar set of challenges to Mike. Regular contributor Dave Williams found himself in a similar position a couple of years ago, so we brought them together. Dave. As a father and husband with a mortgage, I take my responsibility seriously. Yet, a few years ago, I began to think the unthinkable. What if I were to leave the security of my steady nine-to-five job and strike out on my own? Or, given the challenges facing blind people seeking employment, should I stay put? I went for it, and I don't regret it. 
Nick Adamson has been a senior software engineer, working in the same company for 12 years. Such a long stint on the same job is unusual in his industry. But Nick says he's happy in his comfort zone and isn't considering leaving. Well, not yet. Nick is concerned that if he were to move jobs, it would be much more difficult for him as a blind person. Particularly younger programmers, they move on quite quickly. In fact, a lot do something called contracting, which is where you'll go and do a contract for six months, a year, a year and a half, and then you'll move on. And it's a great way of getting experience. It's quite a good way of getting some financial backing behind you because contractors earn quite a bit. And then once they settle down, then quite a lot of them go to permanent roles at that point. The reason I've been there is A, because I love the work. What we do is challenging. The work is quite interesting. The people that I work with are interesting. The products that we produce are fascinating. So there's a huge element of that to it. But there are days where I think, oh, that was a rough day. And there are times where, you know, I think I'm on LinkedIn and I'm forever getting emails from recruiters going, would you like this job? And I'm going, "Uh, no, I think I think I'm happy where I am. I'm very comfortable and it's very much a comfort zone. The concept of starting at a new office and learning a new office and learning all the new systems, the various intranets and how you put your time card in and the training systems and the new procedures and, and all that sort of stuff. It's just a daunting prospect that just to think, well, I'm comfortable and I'm really happy where I am. Why would I put myself through that? But a lot of that is because the additional things about learning the systems and learning the office is made so much more complicated by the fact of my visual impairment. Why are you on LinkedIn? <laughs> Why am I on LinkedIn? Because it's it's a really good way of networking. It's a really good way of finding out what your colleagues that you used to work with are up to. And should the worst happen and that I have to go and find a new job, then it's probably quite a good way of, of doing it. There's quite a a pool of jobs that I would be able to apply for, given my current skill set and given the level of experience that I've got. So the bits of getting the new job that that I would be concerned about is, A, once I get to the interview, is is making sure that I impress. And and I kind of hope the attitude that I bring and the experience that I can show would hopefully speak for itself in that sense. But then it's the proving to my colleagues. You know, I've been where I am for a number of years. I've worked with some of the same guys for quite a long time. They've worked with me. They know that despite my dodgy eyes, that I'm still a pretty good programmer. I can still pull together screens and and visual elements. Okay, they may not be the most beautiful things in the world, but they're certainly functional. And they know that I can be just, you know, off you go, go and here's this great lump of work. We'll see you in three months, get it done. They know that, that that's something that they can leave with me and I can just get on with it. I would have to prove that to a whole new team. And it's not just one or two new starters as it is now every so often that, that I'd have to prove that I'm just as good as a sighted guy. And, and maybe that's more in my head than it is real. But I, I think it probably is an element of truth that I would have to prove myself to a whole team. And that I would have to go through the conversations that if someone's saying, oh, well, we can't give that bit to Nick because he can't see to do it. Or we'll have to stick Nick on just doing the bits that work with sound or whatever, that whatever it is that the thing we're doing, because that's the bit he would be good at. And I'd have to prove myself. And that that is a, quite a daunting prospect. Do you feel a bit like some of your colleagues have moved on to bigger and better things and and you you think maybe you should have made a move at some point absolutely there's guys that i've seen that are now you know principal engineers that that started you know roughly the same time i did there was a, a girl that I was at uni with she goes to a number of different places doing conference talks and stuff and it's all because of the fact that they've moved on and they've done stuff you know and they've got more experiences they've worked in different environments I've only ever worked in one industry. I've only ever worked in one environment. And that I'm, I am conscious of. And that possibly makes me less desirable as a candidate if I were to go and get a new job. On the other side of that, I'm clearly someone that will stick at a job, that will stay there for quite a long time and, and will stick to it. Do you worry that your CV isn't sufficiently varied? Oh, yeah, yeah, hugely. Programming and technology moves on at such a pace that the skills that I graduated with uni, the skills that got me the job, I would now say I'm I, let's say I'm pretty pretty good at. I, I know the languages that I use very well, but I don't know some of the really modern languages. And maybe that's something I need to do more in my spare time. I need to maybe get up to speed with them. But if I'm not using it at work, what's my impetus to go and learn those languages, to learn that new technology? Do, do you think there are other blind people perhaps in that situation where 
they need to move on, but it's actually their blindness that, that is inhibiting them from changing jobs. Absolutely. It would take more of a hardworking environment, more of rubbish jobs and, and bad day after bad day after bad day before a blind person would have to quit because you hear the statistics of, of how many people who are, who are visually impaired and blind that are out of work and how hard it is to get a job. And you know, if you, if you mention on your CV that you're blind, forget any chance of getting an interview and all that sort of stuff. And you just think, it's just so hard that the job market is so hard for for someone who is visually impaired. And I, I'm very aware of how lucky I am that I, I have a job that I enjoy and that it's something that I can go to work and I'm happy to do. And I'm very aware of how lucky I am and, and I do appreciate very much what I have. Would you be prepared to move for a job? Uh, yes, a change in job would almost certainly include a move of house and a, a changing of location for the family. But that isn't that unusual. But it is harder to move as as a blind person, learning Absolutely. new routes in a in a new area, establishing new support networks, and 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 that sort of thing in in a new area. All those considerations would be something that you'd have to think about. Nick Adamson and Dave Williams. Responses from you always welcome, of course. And you might like to pick up on another point made in that discussion. The challenges, let's just put it that way, for visually impaired people of moving house. We want your nightmare stories, of course. But we'd also like bright ideas of making it less daunting. You can call our action line on 0800 044 044 for 24 hours after the broadcast or email in touch at bbc.co.uk. From me, Peter White, producer Lee Kumatat and the team. Goodbye. This is Chris. And this is Pauline. Reading out the questions for the client consultation survey. This is advanced information in order to give you more time to consider your responses. Client consultation. Established in 1895, the Isle of Wight Society for the Blind... IWSB is one of the oldest independent charities on the Isle of Wight. We are inviting clients and prospective clients to have their say and identify their priorities in a consultation exercise that will help determine Isle of Wight Society for the Blind future plans and activities. Our continuing purpose is to provide practical, emotional and educational support for visually impaired people, their families and carers and promote awareness of the needs of those affected by sight loss amongst the general public. We strive to help people maintain independence, learn new skills and participate in social, physical and educational activities to reduce loneliness and isolation. Currently, we organise weekly coffee mornings, educational talks and seminars, craft clubs, weekly swimming sessions, walking and golf, a visiting and befriending service, a weekly audio version of the Isle of Wight County Press and a library of audio books. To help ensure the services we provide in the future meet the needs of our existing and potential clients, the Society will use the survey to guide and develop our strategic plans. With your help, we can ensure that our resources are targeted wisely to meet your needs. Thank you very much for participating in this survey. Your feedback is invaluable in guiding our future. Do you currently use any of the services supported by the Isle of Wight Society for the Blind? Your answer is either yes or no. If you answered no, please go to question three. If you answered yes, please rate how positive each have on your well-being under the following. And the headings are not applicable, not at all, slightly positive, moderately positive, very positive, extremely positive. This is Strollers Walking Group, Dolphin Swimming Group, Millbrook House Weekly Coffee Morning. Bembridge Monthly Coffee Morning. Knighton Monthly Coffee Morning. Freshwater Monthly Coffee Morning. Owls, Millbrook House, Meeting with Guest Speaker. Knitters and Natterers, Social Group at Millbrook House. Striders Walking Group. Talking News, Audio Library. Newsletter. 
Millbrook House Resource Room of Aids and Equipment for the Visually Impaired. Millbrook House Braille Document Production. Millbrook House as a point of contact for information for the visually impaired. Isle of Wight Society for the Blind Volunteer Home Visit Service. Opportunities to volunteer for IWSB. The Golf Group. And the Tempin Bowling Group. Please rate how positive an impact the following services might have on your well-being if IWSB were able to coordinate them for clients. As with our existing provision, the Society covers any general administrative, organisational costs and room use at Millbrook House. Categories are, and we'd like you to say not at all, or slightly positive, moderately positive, very positive, extremely positive. Age appropriate exercise classes such as yoga. Other sport or activity taster days. Support to participate in a sponsored challenge event, e.g. the Isle of Wight Cycle Challenge, walk, run, marathon, skydive, etc. to raise awareness and funds for the society. Craft taster sessions. Monthly food and drink tasting group with sessions at Millbrook House. Monthly food and drink tasting group with sessions at other venues. Quarterly day trips to Isle of Wight heritage sites or tourist attractions. Quarterly day trips to the mainland heritage sites or tourist attractions. Holidays and short breaks organised by the Society, supported with the provision of sighted volunteers to assist with fight, guiding, not care provision. Monthly music group to include singing, listening and occasional concert or live performance visits. Quarterly storytelling or poetry recital group. Your chance to spin a good yarn or share favourite poems. Social activities closer to your home. Introduction to technology course of perhaps six weekly sessions looking at computers, iPads, mobile phones and apps for the visually impaired. Monthly technology group to keep abreast of development in computers, iPads, mobile phones and apps for the visually impaired. Quarterly technology group to keep abreast of development in computers, iPads, mobile phones and apps for the visually impaired. Evening stroke weekend social group for 65 plus year olds. Evening weekend social group for 50 to 64 year olds. Evening weekend social group for 36 to 49 year olds. Evening weekend social group for 19 to 35 year olds. Evening social activities for young people aged 16 to 18 years. Evening social club for 11 to 15 year olds. Evening social club for 7 to 10 year olds. Quarterly evening social meeting at Millbrook House for parents, guardians, carers of young people with visual impairment with separate activities arranged for any accompanying young people. School summer holiday activities or social event for visually impaired young people and their parents, guardians or carers. Dancing. Please add any further suggestions of services or activities you would like the Society to provide. Other suggestions. Please suggest any sport or activities you would like to try. Please identify the challenge event or activity you would be interested in. Please suggest any craft activities you would like to try. Please indicate here the styles of music you would enjoy. In relation to social and recreational activities, please indicate whether you would generally prefer activities targeted and arranged specifically for those with visual impairment or activities that are open to both sighted and visually impaired people where reasonable adjustments are made to accommodate the particular needs of the visually impaired. Visual impairment aside, on a scale of 0 to 10, where 10 is very healthy, how healthy do you feel at the moment? Being connected is more than having a network of friends and family. It could include being connected to your community, 
having the ability to access services or help when you need it and being digitally connected. On a scale of 0 to 10, where 10 is very connected, how connected to others do you feel? On a scale of 0 to 10, where 10 is very confident, how confident are you using technology, the internet in everyday life? For example, using email, the internet, social media, online banking, shopping, etc. How do you find out about the following? The headings are printed leaflets or posters, word of mouth, Isle of Wight Society for the Blind website, other internet, social media, radio, talking news or other and then please specify. Local events, social activities. Contact details for organisations and services for the visually impaired. Health information relating to sight loss. Other health services and information. And travel. About Isle of Wight Society for the Blind. What, if anything, do you know about Isle of Wight Society for the Blind? How would you describe Isle of Wight Society for the Blind to others? Would you favour a name change of the society to promote a more inclusive organisation that supported those with visual impairment? For example, Isle of Wight Vision. Your answer is yes or no. Would you like to suggest a new working name for the society that would reflect a more inclusive and forward-looking ethos? Please remember that this survey and all responses are completely anonymous. Information gathered is purely to enable us to better understand the needs of visually impaired islanders to inform our future plans and services. Please indicate which age range you are in. Under 10 years. 11 to 15 years. 16 to 18 years. 19 to 35 years. 36 to 49 years, 50 to 64 years, 65 to 74 years, 75 to 84 years, 85 plus years, or you've the option prefer not to say. What is your gender? What is your current status? Please tick all that apply. Are you a full-time student of any age? A part-time student of any age? Employed? Homemaker? Unemployed? Semi-retired? Or retired? Do you volunteer for any organisation? Yes? No? Prefer not to say. If yes, which organisation? Please tell us the first part, that is the four digits, of your postcode. Please let us have any comments, questions or concerns. Please identify if you have completed this and independently. Firstly, as a visually impaired client or prospective client or as a volunteer, carer guardian or visually impaired parent. Thank you for completing this survey.